Welcome to the three voice counterpoint response video. Just like in the previous response videos, in this video I'm going to first go over any mistakes, which I'll say what those are, then after that I'm going to go over anything that's unwanted, or point out things that you might not want and or just would like to be aware about. And that is with the single example. So we're going to go through the single example at a time. First, we're actually going to listen to it before we analyze it. Then we're going to analyze it like I just explained. And then after we analyze it, now we comprehend what's going on more. We're going to listen to it a second time so we can hear maybe the things that we analyzed and now are aware about. Then I'm going to actually put it in strings. So what you see in the bass is going to become the cello. What is in the middle voice is now going to become the viola, and what is in the top voice is going to become a violin. This is going to enable us to hear these whole notes a lot better as when you have a bowed stringed instrument like those I mentioned, you're going to hear those notes being constantly played by the bow and the string playing the note versus a piano where you hear the piano play the note and you hear the note and first it's very loud but it quickly dies off and then we'll do this for each exercise. So we're going to listen, analyze, listen again, listen on the strings, and then move on. Okay, so let's get into this first one, but before we get into it, let's talk about any mistakes that we might see and what are the mistakes that we would be looking out for. The first mistake, the most important one probably, would be perfect intervals approached in direct motion, either that being parallel motion or similar motion. When we're here in three voices, we typically don't want any direct motion to perfect intervals, and even similar motion should be avoided at all costs until we have four voices. Then most agree that it's not as bad when you have some similar motion to perfect intervals in your inner voices, aka your alto and tenor voices. However, we're going to see some examples where we see some direct motion to some perfect intervals, and of course, being able to listen to that, you could come up with your own conclusion if this is something that hinders the voice leading to a point to where it's something you'd want to completely avoid, or maybe it's just something you want to be aware about and not use very often, whatever it is, it's good to make your own conclusion here. So moving on to the next one, these aren't in any order of importance or anything like that. I just thought the perfect intervals would be maybe one of the most important ones to mention first. So two, we have unwanted intervals between any voices. This includes the diatonic tritone with the scale that you're using. So let's say we're using a C major scale and we have the notes F and B in the upper voices of a chord creating a fourth. Well, this is still something we want to avoid because there we have that tritone. We try to avoid the tritone at all costs. And that leads us to the third mistake, which would be any unwanted leaps. So this could be a leap of a seventh, a leap of a ninth, or even a leap of a tenth. And again, also including that diatonic tritone of the scale you're using, so you don't want a leap in the melody of that diatonic tritone. Or even worse, if we get into minor and we see like a harmonic or maybe even melodic minor, and let's say we create, for example, a tritone using one of those notes that is the altered note in the minor scale, now we're creating that dissonant tritone with a note that's actually outside of the key and actually a tritone that belongs to a different key. So you can see where that would be even worse. And this is not only just leaps that are bad, but it could also be large leaps that aren't recovered well, creating a disjunct area in the melody where the listener cannot smoothly pay attention to the melody. And then next, not so much a mistake, more of something that would be unwanted, that would be too much repetition of any kind. Whether that is chords, intervals between voices, chord progressions, or even motivity, which is not as common in one-to-one, -one, but still good to consider. So you should look for moments where similar things happen as a reaction to other things. For example, when the bass is leaping a fourth and then following three steps, let's say the upper voices have the same exact intervals and you see that multiple times in the melody. This is possibly something that you'd want to avoid. And we might get into some more things that we want to avoid as we get into that unwanted section of the analysis.
Okay, so now getting into the first example, we see the G major middle response here. So what this means is that the cantus firmus, the given melody, was the middle voice, and then we had to respond to this by adding a bass voice below, and then a top voice above, which would be the soprano voice. When we have three voices, this is typically known as your bass, tenor, and soprano. When you add the fourth voice, that is typically when you're adding the alto voice. It could look like, okay, this is an alto voice where it is existing below the soprano voice, but to not explain too much, it's just the fact that people typically call it the bass, tenor, and soprano when it's three voices. This has some historical background to it, which I will be explaining in my four voice counterpoint video. And it adds to the fact that your upper voices are normally within an octave. But to make it a little easier, I'm going to try my best just to call that middle voice the middle voice. And then the bottom voice, I'll call it either the bottom voice or probably the bass voice. And the top voice, I'll probably call the soprano voice. So starting off, it's a middle voice that we have to respond counterpoint for both below and above. So I started off just with the bass voice, kind of a conventional approach. I like to start from the bass up because it makes a lot of sense to me. Sometimes I start from the upper voice down and I say, hey, I actually want to create this interval. So now I have to respond to that by figuring out the bass voice. But typically speaking, I start bass up. So that's what I did for the most part here. We can see it starts with a 5-8 chord. So you have the octave being repeated now in the bottom voice and also the middle voice. And then the top voice above that has the fifth. So you call it an 8-5 chord because it's an open fifth chord, or in my case, I'm going to call it a 5-8 chord because that makes more sense to me. It's the fifth on top, it's the eighth on bottom. Those are the intervals that are on top of the bass note that you see. Okay, so I'm going to call a 5-8 chord thinking from the top to bottom when I talk about figured bass. Like people say 6-4 chord, 6-3 chord. Okay, so from that first chord, then we go to a 6-3 chord. So above this bass note, we have a third and then a sixth. That's what it means when I say a 6-3 chord. Then we already see something interesting here. What well, we see a repeated note. But we can think back to the one-to-one -one counterpoint video where we learned that oblique motion is allowed in one-to-one -one counterpoint, but it should be avoided. This is because it can cause the listener to focus on the two moving voices and lose focus on the voice that isn't moving. Of course, the point here is good voice leading in all three voices, especially in these exercises. We really want to be able to hear each three of these voices in each measure. And as it moves on to the next measure, as well as listening to each interval and how it harmonizes with the next interval that it is going to. And of course, we want all this to sound good. The one thing to point out here is that the oblique motion could be developed into a suspension as this response here could be a sort of basis of an idea of the intervals that you could use. So this tied note could be something you want to avoid, or it could simply be a marker for later saying, you know, I think I could do a suspension here. It's good to note that you should only repeat when you're in a one-to-one -one counterpoint ratio when you have no other option, or if it really allows you to arrive to the end product that you're looking for. Okay, so now if the figured bass numbers in the bottom look slightly different, that's because I didn't add it in the beginning and I realized it'd be a good idea. Okay, so other than having that tied note in the top voice of measure two, we see that measure two, when going to measure three, is going to a fifth in the top voice. We can easily just look at the figured bass numbers. We can see that in between the bass voice and the top voice, we have a fifth. And of course, we want to see how perfect intervals are approached. So we can see that the fifth is approached with oblique motion with the top voice. And since it was a fifth with the top voice and the bass voice, now we see that the top voice is moving up. So this is not contrary motion, but this is where the bottom voice is moving. In this case, it's just stepping into the fifth while the top voice is staying in oblique motion. So the same note is just moving into that fifth. This is something that is allowed, but it's not as good as contrary motion, and it's not the best choice. But again, this could be a marker for something like a suspension, and this could be developed later. It's good just to be aware of any possible mistakes. Okay, next we can see measure 3 goes to measure 4. We have a 5-3 chord going to an 8-3 chord. So right off the bat, you can think, okay, we have an octave, and not only do we have an octave, but well, we just came from a fifth. 
So we can see the octave is in that top note of the figured bass, showing that it is formed between the bass note and the soprano voice. And we can see plainly that the octave is approached in contrary motion as the bottom voice is moving down a leap of a third, and the top voice is moving up a step of a second. Additionally, we see some contrary motion in the upper voices where that third interval from measure three goes to a sixth interval now in measure four, and we just see that contrary motion. Of course, it's two imperfect intervals, but contrary motion is really good for voice leading. It's not just good for approaching perfect intervals. Okay, before we move on, let's just look at the chords that we use. So we started with that 5-8, so it has the fifth and octave. Then we have the 6-3, so there's a sixth chord. We have a sixth in there, so it's going to apply a slightly different harmony with that sixth in there. It's going to be an inverted chord. In other words, when we're thinking about the harmony basis of the triad, instead of that being the lower note, like in a root position chord, that being the basis of the harmony of the triad, when you go to a 6-3 chord, now the first note that would be your root position triad is now your top note. So the note that is at the bottom of the implied harmony in a root position is now at the top in a first inversion, then of course in a second version it would now be in the middle. Okay, and then you can also see that in the first chord, I didn't keep the chord just in closed position normally how it would be to where you'd have a fifth above your bass note and then an octave above that. In fact, I did an octave above my bass note and then I did a fifth above that. And because the note was an octave, a fifth above it still creates that five in the figured bass. Okay, now measure four, going to measure five, we can see the top voice is doing a leap going down to a fourth from the sixth. We can see the bass voice is also moving down in a step, so everything is moving in similar motion here. We see it's to a six three chord, so from our bass to our other two intervals, we don't have any perfect intervals. Then you also have to check the upper two intervals in the case of three voices to see if this forms a perfect interval. And well, we have a perfect fourth, but as we learned in the three voice counterpoint video, perfect fourths in the upper voices are perfectly fine. And not only that, but something like a diminished fourth in the upper voices can be a lot less of a problem now because now we're able to treat all diatonic fourths like imperfect consonances in the upper voices. But that leads to your choice if you want to have that diatonic tritone in your upper voices, or if that's still something you want to avoid, which is a possibility. Okay, next from measure five to measure six, we see again another tight note. So oblique motion again in the one-to-one -one response. You're not going to see this in every one of these responses, but you will see it in some, and you can come up with your own conclusion if it's something that you want to avoid or not. Remember, it can just be a placeholder for a suspension later if you're going to further develop this idea. Okay, so again, we have that octave with the top voice. We see it in the figured bass, an eight three chord is what it's traveling to. That top voice is moving in oblique motion, so that is fine because oblique motion in the top voice and the bass voice is leaping down a third. So it's a perfectly fine way to approach a perfect interval. Like I mentioned, though, it's not as good as contrary motion. And of course, that means it's not something you're going to strive to actually do. It's something that you can do. Then, of course, just a sixth in the upper voices. So no problem there. Okay, so as you can see, I'm basically analyzing vertically right now. So I'm looking at the harmonic context of everything but I will also be looking at the melodic intervals and such. Okay, so from measure six, we now go to measure seven, where we have a five three chord coming from an eight three chord. So something should go off in your head when you hear eight three chord going to a five three chord. We have two perfect intervals with the bottom voice and the upper voice in both measures traveling to each other. So we need to see this should be in contrary motion. And as we can see, the bottom voice moves up a step and the top voice leaps down a third. So contrary motion going in. And we also see the upper voices just create a third going from that sixth in the measure before. So it all checks off. You can see it is also traveling in contrary motion to that third, which is not necessary, but again, it's helpful. 
Then from measure 7 to measure 8, that 5-3 chord goes to an 8-6 chord. So again, we have those perfect intervals from the bass voice to that upper voice measure to measure. Again, we see contrary motion. Bottom voice leaps down a third. The top voice moves up a step. This one's even better because now the top voice is moving up a step and the bottom voice is doing the leap. It's better if the top voice is only moving a step and it's not the one that's leaping into the perfect interval. Even if we have contrary motion, it just makes it a little bit better. We also see the interval in the top voice of measure seven is a third and in measure eight, it's also a third. This is helpful for the voice leading because you have that imperfect consonance and it is technically traveling in consecutive motion, also known as consecutive thirds. But this is actually helpful for the voice leading because you have that familiar interval, your two top voices, and then it's just moving up a step. So it's very easy to follow. And this is the imperfect interval. So your third and your sixth are very useful when you have consecutive motion in your top voices. This is best done when it is going contrary motion to the bass voice at the moment. And as we can see, that's what's going on. The two thirds are moving up and the bass voice is moving down. Measure eight to measure nine, we can see that eight six chord is now going to a six three chord. So we don't see any perfect intervals except for the fourth in the upper voices, which again is treated as an imperfect consonance. So that's all perfectly fine. Then we can also see that from measure eight to measure nine, we see contrary motion with the top voices moving down and then the bass voice moving up. Contrary motion is always good in counterpoint and for good voice leading. That leads us from measure nine now to measure 10, where we see a three five chord. So we have that third above an open position, but then we have that five making the interval below that with that bass voice. In other words, it could be looked at as a five above the bass voice and then a tenth above that. But the interval is that third from that bass voice. So we're just going to call it a three five chord. Some people might still want to call us a five three chord. But for me, I find it helpful to call it a three five chord because now I know exactly where the notes are and what intervals they are. And then on top of that, I can simply look down below at the figured bass and say, OK, my bottom voice, I'm going from a third to a fifth in the bottom voice of my next measure, as you can see. This can be very helpful. So now we know there's that fifth in the bottom voices, or let's just say the bass voice and the middle voice, we can see that there's contrary motion. So we see the bass voice is moving up a fifth, and we can see that the middle voice is moving down a step to that fifth interval, D and A. Then there's a third above that, with the bass note, which is also forming a sixth with the middle voice. So imperfect interval, but you can also see the contrary motion from measure nine now to measure 10 from that fourth interval to that sixth interval. Furthermore, you can see that continuing on into the next measure, which leads us to the last measure. Okay, so now the second to last measure going to the last measure. We can see that three five chord goes to a chord of just octaves with that bass note. We see contrary motion with the bottom voice and the top voice going into that octave on the top. But then what do we see with the bottom intervals? We see a fifth going to an octave. Okay, and when we look, we see direct motion. In fact, similar motion. This is a good example because this will show how strict do you want to go. A lot of people, and I could definitely agree with this, would say that any direct motion, so parallel or similar motion to perfect consonant intervals in the terms of three voices sticks out a little too much to be okay, but we can see why this may not be so bad if you're not thinking so strictly. First off, we do see a rather large leap of a fifth in the bass voice, and we see the middle voice is just going down a step. Also, it's going in contrary motion to that top voice above it. So some might consider this perfectly fine because it's at the cadence. You have some direct motion. It's not parallel motion. While some may say, well, you do have a fifth going to an octave. So two perfect intervals, probably not the best choice. A lot would probably agree there could be a better option for this. So that's probably the route that I would take. There could be a better option. 
Or in fact, some might just say, no, this is a mistake completely, and sort of they would put an X through this, saying that you definitely don't want direct motion in three voices, and not only that, but you have two perfect intervals traveling in similar motion to each other. Okay, so now we can look at some other things. Still looking vertically, we could pay attention to each chord that was chosen and see how that shifts from chords that use sixth intervals and ones that don't. This is something that can also be very useful, a strategy of switching from intervals that use sixths and ones that don't use sixths. Because again, that's going to be either an inversion of a chord or not an inversion of a chord, and that sixth interval will be the difference of the inversion. Using inverted chords back to back with non-inverted chords can be a very nice musical tool in your pocket to use. A simple chord progression that then is flipped to chords that use sixths and one that don't. And just a better name for this, a lot of people would be calling the chords that use fifths and octaves and such a perfect chord. And then ones that use sixth imperfect chords since they're using that sixth interval. Okay, so let's look at the intervals chosen. First, we see that 5-8 chord. So it's two perfect intervals, but just to comprehend it, from the bass note, you have a repeated note, the same note, and then you just have a note a fifth above that. Okay, so someone look at that as an incomplete chord with the repeated note in there. It depends on who you are, who you ask. Some people find these incomplete chords perfectly fine and helpful for melodic fluency. While others say that you should always shoot for chords that have all three different notes, so it's actually a full chord. Again, that's something you can make your own conclusion of. I use it a little more freely. I'm not worrying all that much at the moment. I'm trying to shoot for complete chords, but I'm not worrying about using chords that some people might consider incomplete. So let's look at each chord to chord. The 5-8 chord goes to the 6-3 chord, so now we have let's say a perfect chord to an imperfect chord, and then we have another 5-3 chord, so we have another perfect chord, 8-3 chord, perfect, and then 6-3 imperfect. So we can see that switching off, and not every single time, every single measure, it's going A, B, A, B, or perfect, imperfect, perfect, imperfect, but it's just switching off between them. And actually, in a sort of random way to create some interest for the listener, not just doing the same exact thing and making it too obvious. So again, we see that perfect chord going to an imperfect chord, going to another perfect chord, to another perfect chord, to an imperfect chord, to another imperfect chord, to a perfect chord, to a perfect chord of two octaves above the bass note. Okay, so that's something good just to pay attention to and possibly something that you'd want to strive for. Because you'll see if you make your own response and you do just only root position in every single chord, there's a chance that it will not nearly sound as good as if you add some of those chords with the sixth in there, or the imperfect chords. And the same thing goes with if you had your response only using the imperfect chords. Okay, so you want to add some of both. And one of the last things that I would definitely look for when I'm still looking vertically is that are there any tritones made between any voices? So in other words, we have three voices, so we could have a tritone between the bass voice and the middle voice, between the bass voice and the upper voice, or just the upper voice and the middle voice. So any of those options, a simple way to analyze that would be to look at every note in the bass. Anytime you see one of the two notes that's gonna make up your diatonic tritone, then you're gonna look at the notes above it. Okay, so let's think what that would be. In a major scale, that would be scale degrees four and seven. In a G major scale, that would be the notes C and F sharp, or F sharp and C. Any combination of those notes in either order is gonna create that tritone. Because of course, a tritone is the same when it's inverted. It's six semitones apart. Doesn't matter if you invert it or not. It's six semitones and six semitones whether it's a augmented fourth or a diminished fifth. So in this case, we'd scan the bottom. Do we see C at all? And then we'd say, do we see F sharp at all? In this case, I've already done that, so I'm gonna spare you from that. And we do the same thing with the middle voice. Do we see C, do we see F sharp at all? Anytime that we'd see one of those two notes, then we compare that to any of the note combinations that I mentioned. 
and again then we'd scan the top voice okay and that would be more of a double check because we probably would have seen any by then but i've actually caught it by scanning the top voice and saying wait i didn't realize there was blah blah, blah note and then i had the other note below i didn't even realize then okay i have a tritone so that's how you'd scan for those tritones harmonically you can also look for the tritones melodically I'll do that for this first one, but I'm not going to do that for any of the other ones because that would just be kind of ridiculous. And I didn't actually do that for all these. So if you want to challenge me, that's something you could do. See if there's any of the tritones. I will mention the tritone for each one because I will just quickly point out if there's any tritone harmonically because I already analyzed that. So I'll just point out if there is one in the other responses. But I guess let's go ahead and see if for this first response, if there's any melodic tritone. So what we do, because as you can see, there's no accidentals in this response. Very easy. We're inside the key using all the notes in the key. So the only tritone that would be formed between these notes is going to be a diatonic tritone between that fourth and that seventh degree C and F sharp. Okay, so let's scan. Let's look for C and F at all. F sharp is in the key signature. So we're just looking for the note C or F. Okay, so now we're going to look at this bass voice only, and we're going to see if we can see any leaps between the note C and F sharp, or F sharp and C, that combination. Okay, so here in measure four, we do see a C, and we see it steps down to a B, so no problem. Then in measure eight, we see the note F, and of course we don't need to look before this because we would have already seen that if we're looking for either of those two notes. So after that, we can see it moves up a step to G. No problem. Then we just see it finishes with the notes G, D, G. So not a lot of C or F sharps at all. And you'll notice that, at least for me, it's not very common for me to actually score either of the notes together that create the tritone naturally, just without thinking about it. So I don't know. Hopefully it's the same case for you too. Okay, so now we'll look at the middle voice. Do we see C or F sharp at all? And yes, we do actually see an F sharp in measure two. But in fact, that just moves up a step to the note G. Then in measure seven, we see the note C again in the middle voice. And that moves up a step to D. Okay, and then that's it for any F sharps or C's in that middle voice. Now looking at the top voice. In measure four, we see a C. And we see the C leaps to a G in the next measure. So a little bit close there, but no problem. Then in measure eight, we see F sharp in that top voice. And it just moves a step down to E. And in fact, after that, we have another F sharp, but that one just moves up a step to G. Okay, so in all, looking for the tritones, pretty simple. It takes some time, but it's one of those things where you spend some time, you get it over with, you don't have to do it anymore, and it can help improve you're writing. Okay, so now that I went over all that kind of technical stuff, now let's actually just look at each voice, how it's traveling, and then also compare how it's traveling compared to the other ones after that. Look at how things are traveling in contrary motion, and also just look at the voice by itself, how it's traveling melodically, the leaps it's making, how those are recovered, and if we see any disjunct pattern that we probably wouldn't want. So let's start with the bass voice. We can see it starts with the note G, it leaps up a fifth to D, that goes up one more step to the note E, and then we're going down a small leap of a third to C. So we see some leaps there, but we see an overall arc to what's going on. It leaps up a fifth, just goes up one step, goes down a third, which a third is the closest thing technically to a step. That isn't a step. Then from there, you actually see a step and then just another third from there. And it's all traveling down from that E that just steps up from that beginning leap of the fifth. So I go saying we see that nice arc goes up and then it goes down a little slower. Then we see it bumps up a step, goes down a third, goes up one more step, it leaps up a fifth, and then it leaps back down a fifth. So even though we see some rather large leaps, we can see a definite shape to the melody. And if we're thinking about this just as a basis, we could see where we could further develop this with some shorter note values, whether that's half notes, quarter notes, or maybe even eighth notes, fill in some of these gaps, make it a little more stepwise, and we could see where that could actually make this work. Okay, so for example, we can see that near the end, we have a fifth going up, then back down to a fifth, 
This could simply be, let's say, a leap from this third to last note in the bass, to where, it, let's say, it just leaps up a sixth. And then from there, it travels to the fifth, whatever measure it's in. It's just the point that from that fifth, then it could travel in stepwise motion down to the ending. So we could see where we could actually make this a lot more conjunct. And overall, we'd still see some good contrary motion, where we'd first see contrary motion with the bass in the middle, or we can see that the bass voice to the tenor voice in measure 9 to measure 10 is moving in contrary motion. And then we can also see that the bass voice from measure 10 to measure 11 with the soprano voice is also moving in contrary motion. And then the tenor voice is also moving in contrary motion to that soprano voice. So we do see a lot of contrary motion here. And if we further develop this, we could still keep the contrary motion in there and just build upon it. Okay, now to look at the middle voice melodically, we can see a lot more stepwise motion here just at a glance. See a first from the first measure to the second measure, we can see it's moving in step, and then it moves in step to the next measure, moves down a third, a step, another third, a step, another step, a third, a step, and a step. Mostly steps, a few thirds, so very stepwise in that middle voice. Then we'll look at the top voice. We can see it looks pretty stepwise for the most part as well. It begins with a leap of a third, which then it stays oblique. From there, it goes up a step, then it goes down a fourth. From that note, it again stays oblique. This leaps down a third, then goes up a step, goes back down another step, and then goes up another step two times to the ending. And you can see the contrary motion trading off between the bottom voice and the top voice where the middle voice might be doing contrary motion either one of those at the time then we see a trade-off where just the top voices are doing contrary motion as well as any of the other combinations you see it's switching off okay so now that we're aware of what's going on here we've actually analyzed this gone in depth to this response, let's listen to it again, and then we'll listen to it on strings. Okay, so you could definitely hear the difference when it was in the stringed instruments. It was actually kind of nice and peaceful, and you could follow the notes. Okay, next we have a response for E minor below. So E minor still having that F sharp being the relative minor of G major, the key that we just came from. And then being E minor below means that below is the cantus firmus or the given melody. So that's what we get. We get the bass line. And now we have to provide the top voice and the middle voice. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing, but I explained a lot in the first response, so you're going to see it's going to be considerably faster for this one and probably each one. I, of course, want to take enough time, so then I go through it carefully, and it's comprehensible for you, but also I don't want to bore you, so I'll try to go efficiently. Okay, so starting off in measure one, we see a 5-3 chord being in E minor. We just have E, G, and B. We can see the contrary motion with the bass voice moving up or leaping up and the top voices both moving down. So now we have a 6-3 chord, but because our bass voice leaped, now our voices are much closer, but the labeling of this is just the relationship to that bass note. We don't see any perfect intervals on the second measure, so no need for anything to actually be in contrary motion with the third and the sixth. 
from the bass note, and then the fourth in the upper voices in measure two. Measure two going to measure three, we can see it goes from the six three chord in measure two to a three five chord in measure three. And again, I call a three five chord because the first interval made above that bass note is a fifth above that bass note. And then above that is the note that would be a third above the bass note, but it's above the fifth. We could think of it as a tenth. I'm just going to call it a third because that's the note that it is above the bass note. So I guess just a quick explanation. That's because I have G here. And if I think 5, 3, well, I could just think, okay, well, the third is B, G, B. And then my fifth, G, B, D. And I see a D. Makes it simple for me. But we can see that going to a 3, 5 chord causes a perfect interval in the bass to middle voice in measure 3. Then we can see, okay, so the bass to middle voice in measure 2, how is that approached? And we can see direct motion. Again, we can see it's direct motion where an imperfect interval is going to a perfect interval. So it's not a perfect interval going to another perfect interval, and it's not parallel motion of, two, of the same perfect intervals but it still is direct motion to a perfect interval in three voices. We want to avoid this. It's your choice if you want to completely eliminate this and call this a mistake, or possibly you can consider this fine because you can see the middle voice is stepping down while the bass voice is making that leap. Not only is the middle voice stepping, but it's also that middle voice that's doing the step. So your choice. We can see from measure three, that three five chord goes to an eight three chord. So now we have a perfect interval between the bass and the top voice. So we can see the A and the A and how is it approached from measure three? We can see it's in contrary motion. From the top voice, it just steps down and from the bass voice, it steps up. So it's actually a contrary motion using steps in both the voices. So of course this could be better for voice leading because steps are always better for voice leading. Then we see the upper voice forms a sixth, so imperfect interval, and therefore no need to approach it, contrary motion or anything like that. But before moving on, we can also see the contrary motion from measure three to measure four, where the bass voice moves up and the top voices are moving down. Then from measure four to measure five, we have that eight three chord going to a five three chord. So again, we have two perfect intervals showing up in that top number of the figured bass, so that would be within the bass note and the top voice. So in other words, we have an octave going to a fifth. And we can see the bass voice is stepping down a third, while the top voice is leaping up an octave. So a rather large leap in the upper voice, but in fact it's the leap of an octave, so it just leaps up to the same exact note that it left from, just an octave higher. If you really pay attention to what's going on here, there's kind of some interesting stuff going on here, and there's some stuff kind of to comment on what's going on with the voices and the leaping, which I'll touch on after this first part of this response. But just in all technical terms, we do see that the fifth is approached in contrary motion going out so that's all fine, and then we just see a sixth in the upper voice. The 5-3 chord then goes to a 5-8 chord. There's a good amount going on here. First, the upper voice is staying oblique, creating that fifth. So right off the bat, we can see the approach to that fifth, that perfect interval, is where one voice, in this case the upper voice, stays oblique, and the other voice travels in a direction either up or down to that perfect interval. In this case, it's traveling up, so that upper voice staying oblique, and that middle voice traveling up a step causes this to be approached just fine, but then that's just within the upper voices, so of course that interval doesn't actually show up on the figured bass. In the figured bass, we see an additional octave and fifth formed from the bass note with the other two voices. First, we see the octave, form between the bass and the middle voice, and we see the bass is leaping down a third, and the middle voice going up a step. So you see that contrary motion to that octave in the bass and middle voice, and then the bass to top voice creates that fifth, and again that top voice is staying oblique, while that bottom voice in this case is traveling down a third. So that makes it acceptable, with that top voice staying oblique. 
Okay, so now from measure 6, we can see the 5-8 chord goes to an 8-6 chord in measure 7. So that octave being formed with the bass in the top voice, you can see the bass voice moves up a step, top voice moves down a fourth, contrary motion. Then you can also see the contrary motion between the bass voice and the middle voice, which doesn't matter because it's just going to a sixth, but it still is helpful. Then measure seven goes to measure eight, an eight six chord going to a six three chord with a raised six. We see this is the note C. If we think of the note C in E minor, that would be the sixth degree. So we can see that having a raised sixth degree would be the melodic minor. Okay, so we do not see any perfect intervals showing up either in the figured bass or within the top voices, so there's no need for contrary motion. But in fact, we do still see contrary motion from the bass voice with the upper voices. The one thing to pay attention to is because we altered this note, the C sharp, is that creating now an unwanted interval, either melodically or harmonically at the moment. So let's first look harmonically, in the bass, we have a G, and with that, we have a C sharp. So you can actually see in this case, this is actually my fault of labeling this as a mistake. This is not a 6-3 chord. In fact, C sharp with G creates a fourth. So this would actually be a 4-8 chord. So, okay, let's just totally redo this chord. Okay, so now that I deleted the response notes, since this cantus was below, now I could figure out, well, what could I do for this chord now. Well, I see it's surrounded by two chords that use sixths, aka imperfect chords. So maybe I could shoot for a simple 5-3 chord. So there's G in the bass, and I could just add B and D in the notes above that. And then we can see because this is a 5-3 chord, we have that fifth formed with the bass and the top voice. And because of what we just did, we are now in contrary motion. The bass voice travels up that third, and the top voice steps down a step. But then if we look at the next measure, we can see I added a D, and now there's a D sharp right after that. So we don't want that. And in fact, I do want that D sharp, though, because that's the leading tone of E minor. And that'll create a good cadence. Okay, so now it's a funny challenge. What could I do instead? Of course, I could just make this a sixth interval, right? But then I have the same note shared with the note before. Now let's say I make it an octave. Well, now we can see direct motion with the bass voice and the top voice that are both making leaps, creating that octave. So this leads us to something interesting. What can we do here? Okay, so I can see that if I keep that third and then under that repeat the same note G, I still make a third interval in my top voices, so there's no need to approach that in any specific way. And also maintaining the third from the measure before allows that interval to travel in consecutive motion, so it's easier to follow. Then we can see there's an octave formed between the bass voice and the middle voice, and we can see the contrary motion with the bass voice leaping up a third and the middle voice leaping down a fourth. So that all works out fine, but then we see there's a problem if we go from this measure to the next measure. We can see the bass and the middle voice create an octave in measure 8 and then a measure 9 if we choose this chord. So this shows a scenario where you might use a repeated note because of course we're using a given melody. It's given. The whole point is we don't want to change what we already have. So above the G we could add a B, we could add the third. And then we could add the 6th above that bass note. So now we have a 6-3 chord, and all that we'd have to do is tie these two notes together. Then from measure 8 to measure 9, it goes to a 6-8 chord with a sharpened 6. So there's that octave form between the bass and the middle voice, and you can see the direct motion now from the 3rd to the octave from measure 8 to measure 9, so we just hit another wall yet again. So you can see where completing one of these exercises can be kind of challenging, because you think you completed one thing, and then you just cause another problem somewhere else. Sometimes you create a lot more problems than you solve. You solve a problem, you create three more new problems, so it can get a little bit ridiculous. 
it's better just to solve it properly the first time, which is why I'm kind of going over this so much in depth, is because normally you just wouldn't make any mistakes. You wouldn't have to go back and in the middle of this make a change. And specifically here I'm in the third to last measure. Not a very good place to all of a sudden say, okay, I'm going to change this one measure. Of course, being one to one, that's the whole note is the whole measure. So I'm just changing this whole entire chord. Okay, last time I'm going to change it and you can see it's not a very good change. It technically works when you're following all the rules, but with what's going on, it's a it's a pretty bad response to this area. So I'm just going to do this and move on. If you think of a better idea, comment in the comments your better idea for this. So I just want to move on to the next ones, okay? And a lot of times fixing something like this, you might have to shift something around it. So you might have to shift the measure or two before or after. In this case, let's look at what I chose. I chose a three five chord. So from the base, we have a fifth above that. And then above that, we have basically like a 10th. This allows there just to be that perfect interval in the bass voice and the middle voice. And we can see it is approached in contrary motion. But we can actually see this was a pretty bad choice, which is good to show. It's pedagogical just to showcase it on this video because you'll see what you should be looking out for. That technically, yes, you do have the sixth going to a fifth in contrary motion. Let's see the bass goes up a third. And we can see the middle voice goes down a seventh. So that's already an unwanted interval that is basically already a mistake if you're doing one to one. So you can see the contrary motion, but you can see it's a really large leap of a seventh. So already at seventh, you don't want that. Other than that, it's a large leap. But then let's look at where this is. So the middle voice goes from C up here in the treble staff down to here D in the treble staff, just being the middle voice. But in fact, the upper voice, this B above this D here in measure eight is just one step below this C. So it's almost like the C would just want to resolve to the note below it, not a seventh below it. So it kind of creates confusion in the voices here because the middle voice seems like it's here, maybe because it's literally a note difference. But in fact, we do have the upper voice leaping a fourth to that B. So all that makes it a bad example. But again, I'm just going to leave it at that. Then we have a 6-8 chord with that sharpened 6. So we see we have that octave. And now we see contrary motion to that octave. And this is actually good because the bass just moves a step. And the middle voice moves up a third. So nothing all confusing with the voices leaping to areas where then the other voice is moving where that voice basically leapt from. You really want to avoid stuff like that. We're going to see a little bit of some stuff like that later as well. And it's a sharp six. So what interval is that? What does it create? Is there anything melodically or harmonically happening that we don't want here now? So with the bass voice, we see we have an F and then we have a D, of course, sixth. And we can see, in fact, right off the bat, if we have an F with a D sharp above that, that is, in fact, an augmented sixth. So we don't want an augmented sixth, but like I was saying, we want the leading tone. This is the moment where you have to choose, would you rather have no leading tone in your second to last note going to your final note when you're using minor, so your raised leading tone, or would you rather just lower it to where it naturally is in the natural minor scale, not creating that augmented sixth, but also not creating that leading tone where it's just one semitone away from your tonic. And that's only the perspective if you choose this note. Personally, I would just choose to redo this, but that's not the point of this review. This review is to see what the response is, any mistakes, anything we can learn from it. So for this purpose, I'm just going to get rid of it. So there's no augmented sixth anymore, but there's also no actual leading tone. But now we don't have a unwanted interval created with a note that is an altered note of the scale that we have. Now we can just move on to the very last measure. From measure 9 to measure 10, we see a 6-8 chord going to an 8-5 chord. 
So a fifth between the bass and the middle voice, and we can see the contrary motion, the bass moves down a step and the middle voice moves up a fourth. Then we have an octave in measure 10 with the bass voice and the top voice. And we see the contrary motion again, the bass voice moves down a step, and we also see that the top voice moves up a step. Okay, still looking at everything all together harmonically, or in other words, vertically, some other things we could look for, tritones. Here in measure five, we see the note F sharp in the bass, and right above that, we see the note C in the middle voice. F sharp and C are going to create that tritone in E minor. F sharp and C, or C and F sharp. I didn't explain that because it's the same as before. So we can see that this is different than it being formed in between the upper voices as a fourth. For one, it's not a fourth, it's a fifth. F sharp and C, a fifth. But now it's a diminished fifth because it's that tritone. And it's between the bass voice and the middle voice. So that is something you want to avoid. Okay, now we can just kind of look at how each measure is interacting, if there's any unwanted leaps and such. To make it easy, let's just start with the bass voice by itself. So the bass voice first, we see right off the bat, the bass voice leaps up a sixth, and then that leaps down from there a fourth. So lots of leaps right off the bat, but we also learned in the three voice counterpoint video that a bunch of leaps can be idiomatic for bass instruments. In other words, bass instrument in the role that they play in the group or orchestra that they are in at the time. So basically, a lot of leaps for a bass instrument may actually fit it very well. Okay, so from measure three, which was leap two from measure two by a fourth, we can see that steps up, then it goes down a leap of a third, goes down a leap of a third again, goes up a step, a leap of a third, and then two steps to the ending. So lots of leaps, mostly a bunch of leaps that are in the beginning, and then after that, some leaps of a third and then stepwise motion. We can see the middle voice is pretty conjunct for the most part. It goes down a third, then goes a step and another step. From here, it actually leaps up an octave. Then from there, it just goes up one more step, goes down a step, and then here we can see a problem. C in the middle voice leaps down to D in the middle voice in the next measure from measure seven to eight. This whole area is pretty bad, so I'll talk about it in a second. So we have that leap of a seventh, we definitely wouldn't want that. And then we have from that D, where it leaped a seventh to, the middle voice, it goes up a leap of a third, here to F, and then that leaps up a fourth here to B. Then we'll just quickly go through the upper voice now. We see it's also very stepwise, a step down, and then a step up and then another step down, that's a little boring there, and kind of repetitive, but then that leaps up an octave, just like the other voice leaped up an octave as well. So it's not parallel octaves, because they're not going to octave intervals, but they're just both traveling in parallel the leap of an octave, which is interesting, because then you can see that for measure four, if we look at the interval, we see the notes C and A, and then we go to the next measure, and of course they both leaped up an octave, so you can probably guess that now we have, again, C and A just an octave higher. So this leads to a point I'm gonna talk about in a second. We'll continue with the top voice. Then the top voice stays oblique, which helps to lead into that fifth created with the top voices. From here, the top voice then goes down a fourth. This goes down another fourth. Then it goes up a third and a step. So kind of disjunct there in the top voice there, not very melodic at all. The middle voice is actually the most melodic from the look of it. Of course, these are whole notes for this point, so the melody could actually come from embellishing this foundation of chords that we have here in whole notes. So that's something good to keep in mind, but it's just good to also point out what's going on. Okay, now to kind of look at the upper section as a whole, so we can look at those moments I was talking about. The first moment I was talking about was where we have C going to A, and then we have the two octaves leaping up, so now we have another C and A in the next measure, measure four to measure five. And, well, this is kind of an interesting thing here. 
because for one we have the same interval leaping up an octave, so it's a familiar interval, we already heard it, and now we hear it leap up an octave. The main thing to keep in mind though is what's happening with the voices while this is all going on, and then also to listen to it and pay attention to this and see what you think. So first looking at measure 4, we see C is middle C, so it's below the treble staff, and then we see the note A is just a third difference with measure 5, except the difference is that this is the top voice in measure 4, and it is a third difference with the middle voice in measure 5. So these are the unwanted leaps in counterpoint that you want to avoid, where you have one interval that is close to another interval, but in fact those are two different voices. And when you do follow the voices, you can see since they both leap up an octave, it can be helpful when trying to follow both them, because okay, they both leap up an octave, sure, but we can see the difference of the top voice in measure 4 and the middle voice in measure 5 could lead to some confusion in trying to follow each voice. So I have the other one I was talking about, but first we can see here we have a leap going down to this note of fourth, and then this one moves down a step. So we can see there's maybe some slight ambiguity in measure six here, where D is going to C in the middle voice, but it's right in the middle of the notes C and E. And this one's not nearly as bad as what we saw before, and if this is actually something that's a mistake is more of an opinion because we can see that the middle voice is traveling down a step and the top voice is just doing that leap of a fourth. So it's still gonna be easy to follow the middle voice traveling in steps and you can decide if that's something you wanna be aware about and avoid or not. But then we can see from measure seven to measure eight, we can see something similar as what we saw before to where this time we see if we follow the middle voice of measure seven we can see it leaps down that seventh. So remember that was already bad to begin with. But let's look at the middle voice and then let's look at the next measure and we can see a note that is one note difference. So just a step. So we can see that C almost looks like it steps to B. But in fact, being the middle voice, C actually leaps down a seventh of D. Of course, we don't want that. And then E is supposed to be leaping down a fourth to B. So it's definitely gonna be bad for voice leading when you're trying to follow each voice and you have between two different notes and measures just a step difference. But in fact, those are two different voices. The voices that are the same are making large leaps. It can be very confusing to follow that. And then after that, we don't see so much of that. So that's just something really good to pay attention to are basically what would be known as bad leaps in the counterpoint both the seventh, but then also what's happening between where the voices are. Okay, now that we analyzed it, let's give it a listen first with piano and then we'll do strings again. Okay, we can see that technically this had a lot of mistakes, but at least for me, especially when putting in the strings, I actually enjoyed how it sounded. I thought it had an emotional, dramatic quality to it, especially compared to a lot of the other counterpoint responses that stay within the rules and don't have any mistakes. So it's kind of funny that this technically made some mistakes in counterpoint, which we need to realize just can hinder the voice leading, making it harder to follow each voice. But that doesn't mean that it's in fact going to. In that case, I could follow every voice perfectly fine, even though there were some technical mistakes. There weren't any parallel perfect intervals or anything like that. There was some direct motion, some unwanted leaps, some unwanted places of the register between chords in one measure and the other measure. But I actually like the effect and the end result. 
So don't think that it's going to create bad music if you create technical mistakes in counterpoint. In fact, you might actually create a different sound if you break outside of what you conventionally are supposed to do. Of course, I'm supposed to be teaching these counterpoint responses, so that's why I'm going over all the mistakes and stuff like that, but I'm also showcasing that with the mistakes, it sounds perfectly fine in my opinion. Okay, now moving on to the next example, we have A major and we are above, which basically means the given melody was above. So the Cantus Firmus given melody was the notes that are above. We had to respond with the bass and the middle voice. Okay, let's get into it. Okay, starting off being A major and being above, we started with that note A. So you can see the bass then repeated that note, of course, it's the bass that has to start with the tonic. So we have A in the bass, then above that we can see the note C forming a third, and we can see that in the figured bass, the 8-3 chord. Next we see that simply goes to a 6-3 chord. Forming a third from the bass and then a sixth, there's no perfect intervals there, and then a perfect fourth in the top voice being treated as an imperfect interval here in three voices makes this not a problem. We do see, in fact, the fourth is actually approached in contrary motion, so that is very helpful. And we do see that the bass and the top voice are traveling in contrary motion here from measure one to measure two. Okay, so now I actually tied the notes that were oblique, and as we saw in the last example, there can be very good reason why we might want to make note oblique, along with this possibly just being a marker for a later suspension. But here we see from measure 2 to measure 3 that note that stays oblique, and it's going into a fifth that is formed in the upper voices. So we remember that if one of the voices stays oblique, then it makes it fine. We see the other voice is just moving in a step, that being the top voice to the perfect fifth interval here. But then that being a fifth in the upper voices, that doesn't show up in the figured bass. Okay, so moving on. From measure 3 to measure 4, so again, a plain 6-3 chord, we just have a 3rd and a 6 above the bass note, no perfect intervals. We have that 4th, which we treat just like an imperfect interval here, and we see it goes from the 5th to the 4th in direct motion, perfectly fine. And then we see overall contrary motion between the bass voice moving up a 3rd, and then the upper voices moving downward. Measure 4 to measure 5. We see a 6-3 chord going to a 5-3 chord. We see the bass note here is actually staying oblique, while the upper voice is stepping down, and it is to that fifth interval between the bass voice and the soprano voice here in measure 5. So that is approached just fine. Additionally, with the top voice just moving down a step, that is helpful, and I hadn't tied that C yet. So we can actually see where not only is A being tied, but C is also being tied. So now, this may seem a little weird, but if we think about this being a marker for a suspension, it could be a possible marker for a double suspension, where possibly one could resolve down like a normal suspension, and maybe one could form a retardation, which is the technical term for when a suspended note resolves upward instead of downward. Of course, some people just call it a suspension either way, but there's the technicality of it. From measure 5 to measure 6, we see the 5-3 chord goes to another 6-3 chord. We can see here between measure 5 and measure 6 that everything is basically just traveling in direct motion. Well, there's no problem because again, 6-3 chord is perfectly fine. Then from measure 6 to measure 7, the 6-3 chord goes to an 8-3 chord. So here the bass voice goes from E down to D, while the top voice goes from C up to D. And this is going in contrary motion towards that octave here between D and D with the bass voice and the upper voice. Then besides that we just have a third between D and F, the bass voice and the middle voice, and that is approached in direct motion by steps. And this is obvious because there's a third also being formed on the bottom note 
with the bass voice and the middle voice in the measure before that. And in fact, if you look back a few measures, we see that there are four measures with thirds at the bottom of the chord in a row. So of course, you can always have too much of a good thing. We try avoiding repetition and motivity in these exercises as much as possible. Four consecutive thirds in a row, in my opinion, is the most you should ever do. There seems to be an unspoken rule in music where you generally do not do something that will catch the ear more than four times. If it serves as just the background, sure, you might have a constant beat that just lies in the background somewhere. But take it a step further, something that's blatantly repetitive. I find that at most times in music, it's repeated only three times. You really hear something that sticks out a lot. That magic number I find is typically three. And then when something is kind of awkward or it's an accident, then if it's repeated, it's repeated exactly two times from what I noticed. So for example, you could tie this into kind of classical and jazz. In classical, if you have a kind of weird sounding moment in the melody or weird sounding melody, then you could repeat that same thing up a third or up a fifth or maybe even transposed in a different key. This would be known as a sequence, and I'm meaning when something kind of sounds really weird. So it's really weird, you repeat it twice, of course you can repeat it more times, but I find if it's really awkward and weird, normally if it is repeated, it's that two times. And then with jazz, sometimes when people are doing improv, they'll do something that kind of catches the ear that sounds like maybe that was an accident, but then they'll repeat it again, and then you'll think, okay, that wasn't an accident. But oftentimes it's just that. They repeat it just the second time, not more than that. I just thought I'd throw that in there because I've noticed that so many times. I listen to a ton of music, and it's hard not to notice it when you pay attention to it. For me, it seems like just the natural thing to do a lot. It just naturally happens, and then I observe that it's kind of interesting that it's usually these numbers. Okay, next going from measure 7 to measure 8, we see the 8-3 chord goes to a 3-5 chord. So now there's a fifth in the bass to the middle voice and we can see the bass steps down a step and the middle voice steps up a step contrary motion in steps and then and then the bass and the upper voice just creates a third but that is also approached in contrary motion by steps from there measure eight the three five chord goes to measure nine with a five three chord we see overall contrary motion and we see between the bass voice and the upper voice a fifth with F and C, and we see the contrary motion of the bass voice leaping up a fourth, and the soprano voice leaping down a third. Other than that, we can also see that there's a third just formed with F and A, the bass and the middle voice. And if you look at the bass voice and the middle voice, you can see it's traveling in sort of direct motion to a third, so it's not really a problem or anything like that. Well, you can see if you compare the upper voices, the upper voices are moving in contrary motion from a sixth interval to a third interval. And if you just look one measure before that, you see before it was a sixth interval. So it goes from a sixth interval, and there's no contrary motion, but that goes up to another sixth interval, and then that goes in contrary motion to a third. I personally think that's a really good choice when you have two of the same intervals on the upper voice that are imperfect, so either a third or a sixth, and then they travel together, so technically consecutive motion of a third or a sixth, but then from there that travels in contrary motion. The consecutive motion of the thirds or the sixth allow that same interval to move in a different place and then contrary motion from that place. I personally just like the way it sounds. Now from measure 9 to measure 10, we see the 5-3 chord goes to the 3-5 chord. So kind of funny, maybe uncreative, whatever you want to think about it. Measure eight has a three five chord, going to measure nine with a five three chord. Now we're in measure 10 with a three five chord, so three five five three three five. But we can see the overall contrary motion. We see this forms a fifth between the bass and the middle voice. We can see the bass steps up from F to G. So sorry when I don't mention if it's sharp or not in the key that we're using. I'm just mentioning the note that I'm looking at, key signature shows whether it's sharp or not. Then we can see A forms a descending leap of a fifth with D from measure nine to measure 10. So it is forming contrary motion between the bass voice and the middle voice for that approach to the fifth, G and D. 
but we can see the middle voice is leaping a rather large leap of a fifth so probably not the best choice is it still fine well listen to it and then decide for measure 10 we see the 3 5 chord goes to an 8 3 chord so now we see an octave being formed with the bass voice and the top voice in measure 11 and we look at measure 10 we can see the bass voice travels up a step and the top voice travels down a step as well to that octave contrary motion by step going inward to that octave so that's a good choice there and then we can actually see the third interval is also approached in contrary motion as well and again it's using steps going from scale degree 4 to scale degree 3 so in the top voice we have what's known as the tenor cadence 2 to 1 in the bottom voice we have the soprano cadence known as the 7 to 1 so we see the soprano cadence and the tenor cadence are in different places and we have what's known as the burgundian cadence or the alto cadence forming the fourth degree to the third degree okay now tritones in the harmonic situation here in measure 10 we see a g sharp and a d this is of course going to form a tritone being scale degree 7 with g sharp and scale degree 4 with d so there's an unwanted tritone between the bass voice and the middle voice yet again if you want a personal challenge try to look at the bottom voice middle voice and upper voice like i showed and see if you can find any melodic tritones of g sharp to d or d to g sharp any of those leaps anywhere it's actually not that difficult and it's just like reading to where it makes you more proficient the more you do now we can just kind of look overall at the response here and we can see that in the first three measures there's not a lot of contrary motion overall with what's happening we still do see a sort of shape where the bottom melody kind of goes up and then goes back down and then the upper melody goes up and then it kind of just dips back up middle voice is just going up so there's sort of a shape there but it's not super contrary when you look at it and because of this it's good to pay attention to the sound of it how is this going to sound now you can see the rest of it after the third measure has a fair amount of contrary motion throughout the voices whether that's between the bottom voice with the upper voice or the middle voice with the upper voice or whatever it might be we see a lot of contrary motion except for chord four and five where we have those two oblique notes okay so now to look note for note at the bass line not looking at each individual note but more so what the note is doing when it's going to the next note any unwanted leaps or anything like that you see the first note in the bass goes up a step that leaps down a fourth then that leaps up a third stays oblique goes down another fourth this goes down a step and then another step which then leaps up yet again another fourth lots of fourths here then it goes up a step and a step to the final note so thirds don't necessarily have to be recovered at all and fourths a lot of people say they don't have to be recovered it's sort of your choice do you think it should be i think it depends solely on the scenario sometimes i would want a fourth to be resolved especially what's happening around it or before it maybe after it but there's other times where a leap of a fourth not being recovered is perfectly fine now let's look at the middle voice we see the first note steps up stays oblique steps down stays oblique goes down a fourth goes down a step goes up another step and then up one more step again then it leaps down a fifth where then it leaps down one more step for the last note the upper voice steps down once steps back up then it leaps down a third goes down a step goes down a third from there it goes up a step goes up another step then it goes down a third goes down a step and another step to the last note so here we don't see really any unwanted leaps at all in fact we see it's very conjunct and to take it even further it might perhaps be a little too conjunct depending on what you're looking for there's not a lot of exciting moments in what's going on here but it could serve as something that's very peaceful Okay, and like before, it's also good to pay attention to any leaps that might create weird moments between the voices. And with such a large gap between the bass voice and the upper voices, you're not really going to see that in the bass voice compared to the other voices so much, but you are going to see that within the upper voices. So here in measure 5, we see it leaps from this third interval down to this fourth interval. 
and try to look for the problem before I tell you. It's pretty obvious. We can see the note C serves as the bottom note in measure 4 and also measure 5. It's staying in oblique motion, and in fact when we look at the next measure, measure 6, we see the same note C, but in fact it's not tied. Well, it's for a good reason, this is because it's now in a different voice. But wait a second, now we have the same note in three different measures, which could be fixable if you're using this just as a foundation. That could totally be fixable, you could work with that actually, and it might be interesting to hold one note through three different measures, because the listener is going to expect every different measure to have a change of note. But in fact, this is a problem, because we have the same note for three measures, and then from two different measures, it's two different voices, so that's definitely something you don't want there. It's going to be hard to follow the voices when the same note switches voices, and then also, to add that, a measure before that, the same note has already been held out. So it's like, okay, what voice is this note in? Holding out that same note for three different measures almost makes it seem like this is possibly implicating it four voices maybe to where the upper fourth voice goes away and now an alto voice emerges of course this is a three voice counterpoint response so it's not something we want to imply so look out for stuff like that pay attention to those leaps between your voices that are close together and make sure you're not making what would be called a bad leap to basically where you would think that these notes being the same would be the same voice but in fact the voice is actually leaping down a fourth. The other top voice is leaping a third into that. It would be known as a bad leap. So that's it for this example. I think I've definitely done enough analyzing this. So now let's give it a listen again, first with the piano and then with the strings. So those tied notes you couldn't really hear with the piano very well, but once it went into the string instruments it actually turned out really nice. I think it had a very peaceful quality to it. Okay, now we are in the next example, G minor middle. So the given melody was in the middle, we had to compose in the bass and in the top voice. We see it starts with a 5-8 chord, so we have the fifth and also the octave being reinforced. Since it was in the middle, we had to start with an octave down below. And also the given melody starting on the tonic, we already have that octave starting off. So in this case, adding the fifth I think is probably the best or one of the best options choosing the third wouldn't be as strong of an entry as using just an octave and the fifth like shown then it goes to a three six chord so not a six three chord but we have above the bass note in the second measure a sixth above and then above that sixth we see a fifth above that sixth but in relationship to the bass note it's a third above the bass note or of course you could consider that a tenth so now we see typically a 6-3 chord would have the interval of a third and a sixth, and then in the upper voices it would have the interval of a fourth, but we have a 3-6 chord here. So the perfect intervals don't show up in the figures, in the figured bass, but we can see in the top two voices it creates a fifth. Not only does it create a fifth, but look where we started from. We also started on a fifth. Okay, so these are obviously parallel fifths, but I haven't had any parallel fifths in any of these examples, and we're supposed to be learning here. So here's an example of parallel fifths. 
when you start mixing around notes in a chord and flipping around the notes that are in the upper voices of the chord tones, you could come up with some different intervals like here, the 3-6, we have the 5th, and now we have parallel 5ths. So obviously this is a mistake. So you can imagine a red X drawn through this. Then from measure 2 to measure 3, we see the 3-5 chord goes to an 8-6 chord. So we have that octave formed with the bass and the upper voice. We see the B, and we see another B, and we see that in measure 2, the bass goes up a step to measure 3, and the top voice goes down a step from measure 2 to measure 3. Contrary motion to the octave. To measure 3 going to measure 4, we see an 8-6 chord going to a 6-3 chord. Being a plain old 6-3 chord, of course like I've talked about, there's no need to prepare this in any way. We have a third above the bass note, and then we have a sixth above the bass note, 6-3. The two upper voices form a fourth, it's a simple 6-3 chord, in closed position above a bass note. Of course, there's an octave gap between the bass and the upper voices, but that is typical in piano writing or even just three voice writing like this. Okay, so no need for a contrary motion, but we see the overall contrary motion again between the bass voice going up a step and then the upper voices going down. Then measure four goes to measure five. A six three chord goes to a three five chord. So now we have that perfect interval on the bottom with the bass voice and the middle voice. And here when we check, we can see that measure four, the bass voice goes a leap down a fourth to measure five. And then in the upper voice, measure 4 to 5, it goes down a step in the middle voice. So we see this is direct motion, similar motion. It's an imperfect interval going to a perfect interval. And it is occurring where the bass is leaping, but the middle voice is just taking a step. So again, whether you want to consider this a mistake or not, like I mentioned in the beginning though, Typically in three voice writing, you are going to completely avoid direct motion, whether it's similar motion or parallel motion. Parallel motion is of course a mistake. That's always a mistake when you have parallel motion of perfect intervals. Things get a little looser when you get into four voice writing and your middle voice is like your alto and tenor, but we're not there yet. But in fact with three voices, you can really follow the three voices really well. So it makes the similar motion to the fifth a lot more apparent versus where it might be hidden a little more in your middle voices in your alto and tenor where a lot of people argue it's not as easy to follow four voices versus something like three voice two voice once it gets into four voices it can become a little more difficult okay so we probably want to avoid this as much as we can but is it a mistake or not that'll be up to you we don't see any problems with any upper voices where we have any perfect intervals needing to be approached in any certain way, but we do see that for measure four to five with the upper voices, contrary motion. Then for measure five to measure six, we see the three five chord goes to the eight three chord. We have that octave from the bass to the top voice. And we do see that in the measure before, the bass voice leaps up a third and the top voice leaps down a third as well. So contrary motion going in to that octave. Then we see a third is produced between the bass and the middle voice that's also approached in contrary motion. Doesn't need to be, but it is. Measure six to measure seven, we see the eight three chord goes to the six three chord. Six three chord, we've gone over this enough times. No need to prepare in any certain way. Let's look if there is contrary motion, and yes, there's contrary motion between the bass voice going down a step and the middle voice going up a step. And then there's also contrary motion between the middle voice going up that step and then the top voice going down a step. Then measure seven to measure eight, the six three chord goes to an eight five chord. Okay, so now we have a octave between the bass and the soprano. We see the bass steps down and the soprano steps up, contrary motion to the octave. Then when we look at the fifth, we already know the bass is stepping down and we see the middle voice is stepping up. So it's all contrary motion in steps to the perfect intervals. So it's a lot better having the steps to the perfect intervals rather than having leaps to the perfect intervals. 
because again, perfect intervals can have a dull sound, not stick out that much, they're actually inconspicuous. Therefore, the stepwise motion helps the listener follow those notes as they're passing through that perfect interval. Then we just see a fourth in the upper voice. Measure eight goes to measure nine, an eight five chord goes to a three eight chord. So we see an octave with the B and the B, and we see that the bass is leaping up a third, and the middle voice is leaping down a third as well. We do see something here I'll comment on later, but we see that contrary motion to the octave, and then having the third above that doesn't matter, but it's also in contrary motion to the third, with the bass voice and the upper voice. Then measure 9 goes to measure 10, the 3-8 chord goes to a 5-3 chord simple root position triad in closed position. We see the F, A, and C, but one thing we gotta notice is that we have a fifth between our bass and our soprano. And in fact, we see direct motion of similar motion to that fifth interval, where the bass is leaping down a fourth, and the soprano is stepping down into that fifth interval. It's a step in the soprano, but it's in the soprano to the bass. It's only in three voices. The soprano does step, but it really doesn't matter. This is definitely just a mistake. I'm leaving a little bit open to conversation if the bass to middle voice is a problem when the middle voice is moving down a step. With three voices, it could definitely be a problem, but some might say that's something you should just avoid and maybe not necessarily a problem or an error. Okay, then next we see that from measure 10 to measure 11, the 5-3 chord goes to a 3-8 chord. So we have the octave on the bottom between the bass and the middle voice, and we do see that the bass travels up a step and the middle voice travels down a step. So we see that contrary motion to the octave in stepwise motion. So that is good. And then we also see a third was chosen above the octave which is also traveling in stepwise motion with the bass and then with the soprano. But it's good to point out that the third ending is not the strongest ending. You do have the octave, but then you have the third in there. There are better choices, but it definitely still works. It may just not be the strongest ending, basically. Now, harmonically, let's see if there's any tritones in here. In G minor, we're going to be looking for the notes A and E flat, that being the second and sixth scale degree of minor versus the fourth and seventh scale degree of major where you find the tritone. And here, if we look in measure four, we see an E flat to an A creating a augmented fourth, which is the tritone between the sixth to the second scale degree. So now being in minor, we can ask the question. Can we raise scale degree seven to avoid a tritone? Or if moving stepwise, can we raise scale degree six, which would either be the harmonic minor or the melodic minor? Doing this, we need to comprehend that if we create a bad interval using a chromatic alteration, like a raised scale degree in minor, it would be even worse. Let's say we had a augmented second or a diminished fourth. Keep this in mind and move with vigilance when you're using these altered chromatic notes in your scale. So we're saying could we raise scale degree 7 or possibly 6 and what degrees in minor create the tritones, scale degrees 2 and 6. I already went over we have scale degrees 6 to scale degree 2 but we can think about G minor and comprehend that as well. So now it's the fact that E flat is scale degree 6 and we do see it's moving in stepwise motion after it. So if I was to raise that to an E natural, then now we see we no longer have a tritone between the upper voices, the fourth, but now we need to make sure that everything's okay as we're stepping away from this and what's going on approaching towards it. And the first thing to probably check is now the interval created between the bass voice and that note that we just changed above it, the middle voice. So we have a C, and we have an E natural, just a major third, no problem there. Okay, let's look at the note before it. The middle voice was at a G, and now it's going to an E natural. There's no problem with that at all. That is a descending melodic leap of a minor third. 
Then from there, let's see how that altered note in the middle voice, that E natural, is now leaving. And we see the E natural goes to a D natural. So of course, that's no problem. A lot of this stuff would just be found in like a C major scale, just a major second. So we can see that actually worked out pretty well using that. And now we don't have a tritone. And also this could serve simultaneously as not only the harmonic minor implication, but an implication of a change of key briefly. We're having E natural would actually be reminiscent possibly of D minor, the next scale up the circle of fifths. Whatever it is, however you want to look at it, we can see it is approached and treated properly, so it works fine, and it actually got rid of a tritone, so it works quite well. Again, I'll leave it up to you if you want to check the bass, middle, and soprano and see if you see any melodic tritones, and that would be the notes A to E flat or E flat to A, leaping to either one of those, either one of those combinations. Now that we've analyzed it, let's listen to it on the piano and then the strings. Okay, so you can really hear it well with the bowed stringed instruments, and you might be able to see what I kind of meant where the 8-3 chord's not the best ending, where it's like, oh, that was a really strong ending, that's definitely the ending. For me, it really was not that very much. Okay, so now looking at D minor below, we can see that we start with a simple 3-5 root position triad in closed position. You have the D, F, and A. Very simple, but I think it's one of the best, if not the best, opening chords, just a root position triad. Really good choice. Next, this moves to a 6-3 chord, again in closed position, as we've talked about a lot. The 6-3 chord doesn't need to be approached in any specific way just in its normal closed position and nothing rearranged in the top voices. Hence why I'm calling it a 6-3 chord. But in fact, we can still see the contrary motion between the bass voice moving up a fourth and the top two voices moving downward. Then for measure two, the 6-3 chord goes to a 3-5 chord in measure three. The fifth being on the bottom, we do see we have a fifth we look how it is being approached. We see the bass is traveling down a fourth from B to F. And then in the middle voice, we see that D is traveling down a step to C. So we see that there is direct motion, similar motion here to a perfect fifth interval. The tenor is doing that step. I included this many times, so not only you, but also I could listen to this many times and say, what do I think about this? Is this something that I'm really going to say is a downright mistake? Or again, just avoid it? Or maybe it's not that bad after all. So let's pay attention to it each time you go back to each response and listen to them and compare them. Because each one of these you'll see has a sort of different feeling to it, just in the response itself. There's not much going on here, but even just figuring out the contrapuntal realization can come up with a different feeling for each realization. Unless, of course, you do them exactly the same. Then maybe not. We do see it being a 3-5 chord. We have a fifth above the bass and then a third above the bass above that. Or again, you could think about it as a tenth. But having the upper voices of a chord rearranged like that, it's good to double check these to see, okay, is this creating any perfect intervals? And if so, is that being approached properly? And we can see notes, actually the interval of a sixth 
but in fact it is still being approached in contrary motion by steps with the upper voices in the measure before it. So we have that direct motion to the fifth, other than that it's fine. Moving on from measure three to measure four, we see the three five chord goes to an eight three chord. So now we have an octave in the bass and the top voice. We see the bass travels up a step and then the top voice travels down a step. Contrary motion in stepwise motion to that octave. Then we see the other interval for in between the bass note and the middle voice is a third and that's also being approached in contrary motion from the bass voice moving up a step and the middle voice moving down a step. Not necessary, but helpful with that contrary motion to the imperfect interval, the third. And then for measure four, going to measure five, we see a five three chord. So now we have a perfect fifth coming from a perfect octave. So now we really need to make sure that this is gonna be in contrary motion. Of course we would regardless, but really pay attention to it when it's perfect interval to perfect interval. We see the bass voice moves down a leap of a third. The top voice leaps up a third as well. Contrary motion outward to that fifth. An open fifth, you could think of it as a twelfth. And now we have something interesting. Now we have a tenth formed between our upper voices, something we probably want to avoid, but just happening here in an instance, maybe not so much of a big deal. Okay, we also see the contrary motion in the previous measure, measure four, going in contrary motion to measure five, where we see that tenth in the upper voices. From measure five, we go to measure six, where there is a chord using two of the same notes, a sixth and a sixth. Having two of the same notes was something that was told to be avoided, but in fact, I haven't listened to that, so now we get a chance to see how this sounds, as well as being aware of something to avoid. So it's definitely something you want to avoid, just having two of the same notes in the upper voices. But now we actually get to hear how it sounds. Other than that, because it's two of the same notes, it's creating an octave. We can see in the previous measure, it's being approached in contrary motion to that octave being created in the upper voices. And we talked about how this was a tenth. It was being approached in contrary motion as well to the tenth. But also that tenth is now going contrary motion to that octave. And not only that, but it's traveling in stepwise motion in contrary motion. So even though we have two of the same notes, that might help it out a lot because we also had a tenth. Now it's just going to an octave, stepwise motion and contrary motion. It might not be actually something that one would want to consider a mistake. Of course, if you're always doing the same thing everyone else is doing, it'll sound the same. So if you find a chance to do something like this to where conventionally you probably wouldn't do this, but we see it's being approached in a certain specific way. In this case, we might be able to access an interval or a chord that we usually wouldn't use, creating a different sound that you normally wouldn't hear. This can also create interest for the listener, and we know a part of counterpoint is not just everything to do with the technicalities, it also has to do with how interesting is it for the listener. If the listener finds it boring or the tenor voice is just really boring, are they really going to pay attention to that much? versus if they hear three voices moving in these intricate, awesome ways and they are following it because it's so interesting, they can't tell what's gonna happen next, but they're also getting led up to all these expectations, being thrown off and having an enjoyable experience. Okay, so we gotta make it interesting for the listener for them to actually be able to pay attention in the first place. Then we see from measure six to measure seven, the six, six chord goes to a three, six chord. So again, having that three six chord, we actually have a fifth in the upper voices. The bass to the other voices, we see we just have a sixth and a third, so we don't have any need for approaching it in any specific way. We do see contrary motion between the bass voice moving up a step and the top voice leaping down a third, but where we need the contrary motion is to the upper voices creating the fifth which being in the upper voices doesn't show up in the figured bass. We do see contrary motion traveling to the fifth. The middle voice goes up a step, the top voice goes down a third. The top voice leaps into the 
perfect fifth, but it's in contrary motion and it's just the leap of a third. So it's definitely not something that's going to be considered a mistake or anything like that. Then from measure 7 to measure 8, we see the 3 6 chord goes to an 8 6 chord, where you can see we have a perfect interval of an octave between the bass and the top voice. And now we do see technically that our bass voice is moving up the step of a third, and the top voice is moving down the leap of an octave. So technically it is in contrary motion going to the octave, but is this the best choice? And I would say no for many reasons. One, the top voice, the soprano, is leaping an octave to a perfect interval. That's quite a large leap to a perfect interval in the top voice. It'll stick out a whole lot. But then in fact, the perfect interval is not something that sticks out very much. So it sticks out a lot to kind of a dull sound. Next, we can see that the register change from measure seven to measure eight is pretty big difference in the upper voices, where the top voice leaps down an octave and the middle voice leaps down a sixth. Again, this can be confusing for the listener to follow just the plain three voices here, as we see the relationship between the bottom voice in measure seven is much closer to the relationship of the top voice of measure eight, making it seem like those have a relationship to each other, or in other words, makes it seem like the bottom voice from measure seven is just going down the leap of a fourth in measure eight from B to F, but in fact, that's actually the lower voice traveling to the upper voice of the interval in the next measure. So it's just confusing to look at. The other thing is, okay, well, how does it actually sound? How not just to look at it, but looking at it, we can comprehend things that will help us understand why it might sound a certain way. Where you listen to it and we say, okay, that doesn't sound good right away. We already analyzed what could be the reason and we could fix that and see if it sounds better. If it does, then that's a very efficient way of working. Okay, so we see the contrary motion to the perfect interval, but it's definitely a bad leap, something that you'd want to avoid here. Kind of confusing to follow those voices in the top voices with how it's leaping and how the intervals correspond to each other from measure to measure. But again, we gotta listen to it and then from there make up the decision. You might say, no, actually, it's pretty easy to follow that voice. I could totally tell that there's just a fifth up here and then I could hear the voices going down here and you know, it's only three voices, so you can really hear it a lot better and that may actually help you follow them more. You might think because of that, this is no big deal. Of course, it's good to come up with your own conclusions. So that's why I'm offering some different viewpoints here. Measure eight, going to measure nine. We can see the eight six chord goes to a three six chord. So now we know the three six chord, we have that fifth in the upper voices. But first, we just have the sixth in the bass to the middle voice. So of course, being the three six chord with the bass note, there's no perfect intervals. But in the upper voice where we see that fifth, we see that it is in fact traveling in contrary motion and stepwise motion from the third to the fifth. D, F to C, G. From measure nine, that three six chord goes to a five three chord in measure 10 at the ending. And I was saying I think 5-3 chord is one of the best options. Now pay attention to how this is going to lead what at least I think is a much stronger sounding ending. But in fact, we're not quite done yet. So just pay attention to that when I actually end up playing it, which will be soon. Okay, and then with that fifth in the upper voice, of course, let's look at that. We have the bass voice moving down a step and the top voice moving up a step contrary motion in stepwise motion, and then there's contrary motion with the bass voice and also the middle voice. Bass voice moves down a step, middle voice leaps up a fourth. The top cadence is a seven to one cadence. Looking at measure nine to measure 10, the top voice creates a seven to one cadence known as the soprano cadence. The bottom voice goes from scale degree two to scale degree one, known as the tenor cadence. And then the middle voice does something, I don't know if it has an actual name, but I go from scale degree five to scale degree three. So you get a taste of scale degree five, going to scale degree three, but it's also within the same chord as scale degree one. So you have scale degree five, 
going to a chord that is skill degree one's chord, and then again you have skill degree five forming a third above that skill degree three that the skill degree five goes to. Okay, now again, looking at any harmonic tritones formed between the intervals in each measure. Here in measure five, we can see the note E forms a fifth with B flat in the top voice. Being minor, E is skill degree two, and B flat is skill degree six. And now again, we're in minor. So could we raise the skill degree seven or six? What notes are we looking at? And in fact, if something occurred in the bottom note, we wouldn't be able to change that because this is D minor below. So we're supposed to be working with that given melody. But in fact, the note that we would be able to change would be the top note, the B flat. B flat would be the sixth scale degree of D minor. Therefore, if we want to raise it and now make it a B natural, this could serve as a good choice as long as it's not gonna create any intervals that we don't want within the harmonic interval we're working with or between the measure before it or measure after it with the melodic intervals that it's going to be forming. And since this is scale degree six, this is the melodic minor. It's not just the harmonic minor. Because of this raising scale degree six in measure five is gonna depend on whether you think it's an appropriate time to use the melodic minor. If this is only for a harmonic purpose, AKA you're just harmonically looking at the chord and you're thinking, well, harmonically in this harmonic interval and this harmonic chord, I'm gonna change it to this for this reason. Well, that would be the mindset that would fit harmonic minor. Melodic minor is not used for harmony, it's used for melody. So you gotta pay attention to what the note is doing. If it's moving and what could be looked at as melodically, then this could serve well. However, if what is being surrounded by it's just leaping all over the place and very disjunct, that wouldn't be a very good time to use melodic minor. And using the melodic minor more, you'll come to realize why it's told to be used only for melody. Furthermore, it's actually taught to be used for melody going up, but then the natural minor is used on the way down. So some might argue that when there's stepwise motion going down, that you don't want to use the melodic minor. It might be against some rule that some people might think of. I don't think that there's any strict rule that people can agree on where it is some set rule that you have to use melodic minor only when ascending and you can't use it when descending. I've actually seen people say the opposite, where you have to use natural minor going up and melodic minor descending. But it is good to know that during the common practice period, it was not only common to write the music that way, but it was common to be trained to play your instrument that way. That if you're playing the melodic minor, well, you play the melodic minor up and the natural minor going down. That was often just called the melodic minor. And now again, I'll leave you to figure out if there are any melodic tritones, AKA leaps between E and B flat or B flat and E in any of the voices, bass, middle, and soprano. Okay, so now that we've raised B flat to B natural of D minor, let's make sure we didn't just do something that we don't want. So now let's just look at the bass note to the altered note. We have E to B natural, just a perfect fifth. And of course we should know that because we just raised it. So now it's not a tritone, but now it's a perfect fifth. And now the middle voice to the upper voice, we see a G and a B natural. So we know that's just a major third. In fact, it could be looked at as a compound third, a tenth, because obviously the note's not a third above it. Then let's look at the measure before. The top voice is a G. G then goes up a leap to a B. Well, we basically just went over that. G to a B is a major third, no problem there. And then let's look how it leaves and goes to the next measure. So we can see B then goes to A in a step. B natural to A is just a major second. And also the stepwise motion and conjunct nature to the melody for the most part allows the melodic minor to be used in a justified manner. Okay, so now that we've gone over everything, let's listen to it, piano, and then strings.
Okay, and one thing to note there is that, as you can see, it started with a 5-3 chord and ended with a 5-3 chord. The same note in the bass and the same notes in the upper voices, but the upper voices are an octave higher in the first measure and they are an octave lower in the second measure. I put it in there for a reason, so I thought I'd just point it out. Now moving on to the next one and the last one. In case you might have noticed, the ending is a little different in this one, and I am going to explain that. First of all, we see we're E major above, so the given melody was above. We responded with the bass and the middle for this one. An 8-5 chord was chosen as the first chord. Again, with the given melody starting on the tonic above, we had no other choice than doing an octave in the bass, which led us to say, what interval should we choose above the bass? and in the middle of the other octave, which would be not only a chord that we're able to use in these exercises, but also one that serves as a good opening and introduction to the scale that we're using. So I think this is a good choice here, the fifth and the octave, which we had to use the octave. Then this goes to an eight six chord. So we can see an octave is formed between the bass and the upper voice. We can see that the bass moves down a leap of a third, we can see that the upper voice leaps up a leap of a sixth, so we do see that contrary motion outwards to the perfect interval. Having the leap of a sixth is a rather large leap. We can see how far the bass and the upper voice are spread apart. I don't think there's going to be a problem hearing the upper voice. Other than that, we do see contrary motion with the upper voices of measure one to the upper voices of measure two. The other thing to comment is that we see the note A with the note C above that, so we actually have a tenth again in the upper voices here. Again, it's traveling in contrary motion to that. That's not necessary, but it's going to help, especially with doing a large interval like this over an octave. Then we can see measure 2 goes to measure 3 with an 8-6 chord going to a 3-6 chord. With that 3-6 chord, we have a sixth above the bass and a third above the bass above that sixth but we have a fifth in the upper voices. But in fact, it is moving in contrary motion with the upper voices in measure two before, where the tenth is now traveling in contrary motion to the fifth. The middle voice moves up a leap of a third and the top voice leaps down a fourth. From here, measure three goes to measure four. The three six chord goes to a five three chord, a root position triad in closed position. We see the D, F and A, there's a fifth form between the bass and the upper voice. And we can look before that, the bass note is traveling down a step and the upper voice is traveling up a step. So we have contrary motion to the fifth in stepwise motion. Then we have the interval of a third between our bass and our middle voice here in measure four. But we can look again, measure three, and see that it's also traveling in stepwise motion in contrary motion to that third interval, even though that's not necessary. Then from measure four to measure five, the five three chord now goes to an eight six chord. Now we have an octave, not only that, but we went from a perfect interval in the measure before that, a fifth to now a perfect interval in this measure with the octave. So we can see the bass travels up a third and we can see the top voice also travels down a third. So we have contrary motion to that octave from the fifth. Other than that, it's an eight six chord, so we have a six between the bass and the middle voice. It doesn't have to be approaching contrary motion, but we can see that it is with the bass moving up that third and the middle voice moving down that third as well. One thing one could point out is the position of the notes in the intervals of the top voices and how that may cause confusion between the voices, but also probably is not that big of a deal with the intervals chosen with the consecutive thirds, which will be very easy for a listener to follow. Then measure five goes to measure six. We see it's a five three chord again, that root position triad in closed position. And we see the octave is now going to a fifth. And we can see the bass voice travels up a step, the top voice travels down a third. 
So we see that contrary motion from the octave to the fifth. Other than that being a 5-3 chord, we see the bass voice creating a third between itself and the middle voice, which is also approaching contrary motion with the bass voice traveling up a step and the middle voice leaping down a third. Then from measure six to measure seven, we see the five three chord goes to an eight six chord. So we have an octave from the bass to the upper voice. And in fact, it's traveling from a fifth. So another perfect interval. We see the bass is traveling down a leap of a third and the upper voice is traveling up a step. So contrary motion to that octave. Then it's an eight six chord. So we have a six between the bass and the middle voice. This is also being approached in contrary motion, even though it doesn't need to be. The bass going down a third, and the middle voice going up a step. So lots of contrary motion, a lot of stepwise motion. This is all very helpful for the voice leading. Then we can see measure 7 goes to measure 8. The 8-6 chord goes to a 6-3 chord. We know nothing fancy with the 6-3 chord, but let's still look at what's going on. The bass voice travels up a fifth. The upper voice travels up a third to that sixth. And then with the bass traveling up a fifth compared to the middle voice, the middle voice is traveling up a step. So we see everything is traveling in the same direction, whether you compare the bass to the middle voices, the middle voices to themselves, or whatever. It's all similar motion there, but that's not something that happens very often. So not only will it serve as a moment that is unexpected, but might create a different sound than normally one would create when doing counterpoint. Then measure eight goes to measure nine, the six three chord goes to a three six chord. By now we should know the three six chord option is going to have a fifth in the upper voices. And being a three six chord, it just creates a third and a six between the bass note. And again, between measure eight and measure nine, we see that all the voices are moving in similar motion. So there's no contrary motion there at all. And this also means that there is direct motion going to this perfect fifth between the upper voices. Okay, so direct motion to a fifth and just in the upper voices, definitely a mistake. So again, think of a red X through right there. But then we see the final notes, the cadence, measure nine to measure 10, the last measure. We see a three six chord going to an eight six chord. The 8-6, we have that octave between the bass and the upper voice. We see the bass moves up a step and the upper voice moves down a step. Contrary motion in stepwise motion to that octave. Then we have a sixth and compared to the bass, the bass moves up a step and also the middle voice moves up a step. So both just moving up a step. And you might say, wait, we ended on a 8-6 chord and having that sixth interval in there, that imperfect interval, is going to hint at an inverted chord. And therefore, we're not gonna be ending on a chord that's implying the tonic anymore. And yes, that's why I chose this as the last response. This now shows a cadence which can serve as a modulation. The note C sharp between the two E's now hints at a C sharp minor chord and possibly key. If one chooses the notes G sharp, B sharp, and D sharp as the next chord, this would further emphasize C sharp harmonic minor, which would be the relative harmonic minor to E major, the original key. So this could serve as a modulation to the relative minor, whether you choose to make it a harmonic minor or not, by whether or not you choose to raise that B natural to a B sharp, or just keep it B natural, which would be the seventh degree of C sharp minor. All this simply makes sense because a sixth interval built on scale degree one would be scale degree six. And we know scale degree six is the scale degree that serves as the relative minor of the scale that we're using. Or in other words, a minor third down or a major sixth up. Okay, but now, is there any tritones harmonically? And yes, here in measure four, we see a tritone between D sharp in the bass and A in the upper voice. We are in E major though, so of course we could alter a note in the scale, but we're not gonna be trying to modulate in any of these counterpoint responses. So in this case, I'll just show this as a mistake that should have not been in there originally. And again, you see if there's any melodic tritones. 
those being A to D sharp or D sharp to A. We can look at the bass voice by itself. We can see how it leaps down a third, leaps back up a third, leaps down a step, goes up a third, goes up another step, leaps down a third, leaps up a fifth, then leaps down a fourth, and then goes up a step. So we actually see quite a large amount of leaps starting from measure six to measure nine. A third, a fifth, and a fourth. Of course, that's not a whole lot going on there, but it's just not super conjunct in that little period. Something good to point out. Again, a leaping bass line could be idiomatic for bass instruments. Let's look at the middle voice. The middle voice goes down a step, goes up a third, goes up a fourth, goes down a third, goes down another third, goes up a step, up another step, down a third, and then up a step on the last note. The upper voice leaps up a sixth, then it leaps down a fourth, goes up a step, leaps down a third, leaps down another third, goes up a step, then leaps up a third, goes down a step, and then another step to the last note. Now again, there's sort of a big gap between the bass and the upper voices, so let's look at the upper voices and see if there's anything unwanted happening especially when the registers are changing from one chord in one measure to the next chord in the next measure like we saw before where we had some possible confusion in following those three voices when sometimes we had some implications that the middle voice and the top voice were hard to follow which again is all when looking at it so then there's also how does it sound does that correlate directly to how it sounds often it does but it does not always. Okay, so looking for those bad leaps, sort of say, things that'll confuse the voices and the register. And we see overall a lot of contrary motion in the beginning, so definitely wouldn't be a problem there following anything. That's why contrary motion is so good, because we can easily hear the voices going out, back in. We see starting on measure four, all the way to measure seven, four third intervals in a row, traveling consecutively, and again, I think four of anything that will stick out enough for you to notice it is enough. You should not do more than four. I think four is almost like the golden number, or possibly three if it sticks out a lot. So there's a few things going on here. One is that the same thing happens with the register. Let's look at measure four. The middle voice in measure four becomes the same note as the top voice in measure five. Okay, so by looking at it, it doesn't look all that great. But when listening to it, you might see that the third is very easy to follow. You hear the third, now you hear the third down here, and that's all that happens. These being the two same note, maybe there could have been a better choice where the thirds don't just travel down and replace the same note from the lower voice before to now being replaced with the upper voice in the new measure. But you can listen and see for yourself if this is something that is going to cause confusion in following the voices or if it's going to be perfectly fine because you have these thirds that are very easy to follow or maybe it's somewhere in between to where well I mean the thirds are pretty easy to follow but at the same time we do see these notes sort of overlapping between voice to voice and because of that there definitely probably could be a better option or maybe you really like the sound of it and you want this okay so that's the enough of me talking about this consecutive thirds Anything else looking at bad leaps? Well, no, we see that we have this third here and the next note that it's traveling to in the lower voice actually sits in the middle of those two voices, the middle and the top voice, the measure before. But in fact, the lower voice is traveling up a step, very easy to follow, and the top voice just moving up a third, extremely easy to follow. It's not gonna cause any confusion there. And then we see after it, the middle voice of measure eight is right there in the middle of the middle and the upper voice of measure nine. So you might think visually may cause some ambiguity, who knows, but I mean already visually you can see that the D goes down to the B as a third, and then the G goes down to the F in step. So very easy to follow, it's not going to cause the confusion like we saw in other scenarios. Then that fifth just plainly travels in stepwise motion, in contrary motion, to the third that is the last interval in those upper voices of that last measure. We can also see the bass voice forms a 7 to 1, the upper voice forms a 2 to 1, 
but the middle voice forms a 5 to 6, implying that minor. Let's talk about those last two measures. Okay, so now that we talked about and analyzed everything in this response, now let's listen to this one, piano, and then on strings. Okay, so that's it for this video. If you enjoyed the content or learned anything, be sure to give the video a thumbs up. If you want to keep seeing more content like this, subscribe and I will have a lot more content like this coming up as well as I already have a lot posted. Check out my playlists. I have a counterpoint playlist I'll link below. You can find a lot more playlists on my channel as well as if you missed the three voice counterpoint video as well as any of the other counterpoint videos, be sure to check those out. They're all in that counterpoint playlist. There's exciting things coming up. I haven't quite done it yet, but I'm gonna have videos on a bunch of things, including solmization, the rule of the octave, which will go hand in hand with things like thorough bass, basso continuo, which is all sort of related to the composition side of it and also the improvisational side, but leading all into being able to compose. Then from there, okay, we wanna compose, maybe we wanna compose for the orchestra. Then I'm going to start having a lot of videos on the orchestra. From an intro to the orchestra, all the instruments, all the sections you can have in the orchestra, with the strings, woodwinds, brass, and percussion, as well as isolating each family, focusing on, okay, the string family, the woodwind family, and then each individual instrument. Okay, now we're going to look at the violin, and we're really going to study that. And each one, the cello, viola, double bass. Now let's say we'll look in the woodwinds, specific instruments, we'll look at the clarinet. We have a clarinet in A, we also have a clarinet in B flat. Not only this, but we have auxiliary instruments. So in the woodwind family, when we have the clarinet, we also have the piccolo clarinet. We also have the bass clarinet. And you also have the E flat clarinet, which can be known as the soprano clarinet, along with a bunch of other instruments and their auxiliaries. But then I also have things like score analysis and score challenges. You might have seen that I wrote and released the first movement of my violin sonata, sort of still in a rough draft form, mainly for pedagogical purposes, showing how I developed a melody based on two voices into an entire movement. I also have similar challenges for you, where I will challenge you to write a violin solo, a violin sonata, and some more things. So a lot coming up. I've just been actually extremely busy and it's been sad that I haven't posted more videos. I have so many videos waiting to be uploaded. And in the near future, I'm gonna have a lot more time and you're gonna see a ton of videos being posted right around the corner. And last thing, if you had any questions or comments, feel free to leave that in the comments of this video or you can personally email me if you choose. I will try my best to respond. Until next time, take care, goodbye.